Hello. Good night. Thank you for the all participants of this meeting. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to open this section with so important cardiologists, interventionists, uh, and uh, for the for this hospital is very important uh, international meetings to to put in perspective our uh, our roadmap uh, about cardiology, especially in heart uh, and valvular disease. Uh, I would say I, I would like to say thank you for our international participants and also uh, our colleagues here, uh, Dr. Marco, Dr. Sarmento Leite, Dr. Jair, all the speakers that uh, this night started this meeting. Uh, this is a challenge to, 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 to put all the perspectives of uh, uh, this disease because we need to reduce interventions for our patients to minim mi minimize the, the, the results uh, about the, uh, all the problems that the patients suffer on this uh, incredible uh, disease. So uh, I would like to invite Dr. Carizzi to, to present all the people and say that Dr. Carizzi is our cardiology chief. It's very important partner to, to build this uh, service and we need uh, more integration and uh, uh, an approach with all colleagues and all friends. Thank you very much. Success in the two days, in the next two days. Thank you, Nazi. Good evening to everyone. It's uh, really a great pleasure to start uh, this or opening this symposium, this two-day symposium about valvular disease in our institution. For those who don't know HMV or Hospital Muiz de Vento, this is a philanthropic hospital with almost 500 beds. And we are uh, probably the top five ranked hospital, private hospital uh, in the country. So it's, it's really an honor to participate uh, in this event. Uh, without further delay, I would like just to say that this event, it's a kind of uh, mark for us to start to increase uh, our reference or to be reference in some cardiovascular disease. And here I pointed out the valvular disease and definitely more structural disease that we would like to be a reference in a national and regional uh, perspective. Uh, this event actually launched the Center for Structural Disease in our cardiology service, and probably you'll be here from our colleagues here at HMV, and actually it will be really, really important to have all the international collaborators that uh, we will have today, uh, tonight, and tomorrow. So without further delay, I would like to thank all the international speakers, the national, our colleagues here from HMV and other institutions for all the support and the work that they put together for this event. I'm sure we will have a great uh, symposium for these two, uh, two nights. And definitely, I would like to thank you for almost more than 1,000 registers that we have so far for this event. So I wish you all a great symposium. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's get uh, moving and uh, it's a real pleasure. It's a, I'm truly honored to start the first session of uh, uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to be addressing the mitral valve tonight and tomorrow, as you know, we're going to be addressing aortic valve disease. We've been trying to put this uh, program together. Uh, it's a very nice group, Rogério, Eduardo and Orlando. 
the, okay, sorry, there was some loud noise here. And uh, without any further delay, um, I'm going to call, uh, invite my co-chairman tonight, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Pedro Lemos, who is a, he's a great friend of us and uh, been working together for a long time. So, Pedro, uh, it's my pleasure to call you to get started with our first uh, lecture, please. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's uh, really great to be here with me. So, uh, with no further delay, let's just uh, start our, our uh, session, uh, which is entitled Clinical Perspectives for the next speaker, Clinical Perspectives and Patterns of Valvular Heart Disease. Flavio uh, Tarash uh, Soto will uh, deliver this talk. Flavio is the director of the unit of valve disease at the Heart Institute. He's a professor of the University of Sao Paulo Medical School, and he is the coordinator of the guideline, just published the guidelines of the Brazilian Society of Cardiology on valve disease. So, Claudio, yeah, you have the word. You see my presentation, Pedro? Uh, actually, I can only see myself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, I only see my you camera. See everybody? I, uh, uh, Pedro, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to participate in this symposium. My lecture is about clinical perspective and patterns of valvular heart disease. It's an important message. How can we obtain this assessment, the best diagnosis strategy to define the severity of valvular heart disease? It's important, meticulous history, detailed physical examination to diagnose the severe of valvular disease and adequate interpretation additional exams like EKG, X-ray, echo Doppler cardiogram and cardiac tomograph and cardiac magnetic resonance. It's important to interpretation the exams. It's, it's not good to read the results they exams. According to Brazilian I've, um, I think can they can listen here? Okay. I think Flavio's uh, uh, internet connection is having some uh, troubles and uh, we're gonna get started restarted very soon okay is is it there sure okay and I think his slides are not you now see that my slides no we cannot see your slides Flavio sure okay I Now it's okay? Um, I think you have to share some, somehow. Okay, now it's okay. Now it's perfect. Thanks. Now it's okay? No, perfect. yeah, it's perfect. Go ahead. Are you? Go ahead. Are you? Yes, fine. Everything okay. is fine now. Now it's okay? It's sure. It's okay now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pedro, thank for your invitation. The Sarmento is a pleasure to participate in this symposium. My lecture is about clinical perspective and pattern of valvular heart disease. It's an important message. How can we obtain these assessments, the best diagnostic strategy to define the severity of valvular heart disease? Meticulous history is very important. Detailed physical examination to diagnose the severity of valvular disease and adequate interpretation of additional exams like EKG, X-ray, echo Doppler cardiogram, cardiac tomography, and cardiac magnetic resonance. It's important to interpret the exams, not to read the results. According to Brazilian guidelines to 2020, 
five steps are important to define the best diagnostic strategy and decide the best treatment. First steps, evaluation of the anatomic severity of valvular heart disease. Verify whether the valvular heart disease is anatomically severe through physical examination and completory exams. Step two, etiology. Evaluate etiology include clinical and past history is included beside complementary exams. And our Brazil guideline step three, symptoms secondary to the valvular heart disease. In, this is evaluate, uh, evaluate symptoms. This is a fundamental to intervention before decision making. And in the step three, pharmacological treatment only indicates to alleviate symptoms until intervention takes place. Step four, prognostic factors. Evaluation anatomical and or functional prognostic factors. For instance, pulmonary hypertension, ventricular remodeling, systolic dysfunction, aneurysmatic dilatation of the aorta, mainly by cuspid valve, aortic valve, and atrial fibrillation. This is can this this is can decisive regarding intervention in asymptomatic patients. And in accordance to Brazilian guidelines, step five, type of intervention. The procedure can be surgical or transcatheter intervention. It's important to individual, individual, individualize indication depending. Surgical, risks, frailty, comorbidities, and heart team decision. In my presentation, I will present some key words about for valvular valve, valves. And the treatment in primary and functional population. How to define diagnostic and prognostic factors in aortic regurgitation? And how to define diagnosis in special groups, and guidelines? I would like to emphasize in severe mitral stenosis, the step three, excuse me, step three, no symptoms, no dyspnea and check the prognostic effect factors in pulmonar hypertension. And this is a very important step. Uh, it's no symptoms and the checkers. It's important to ask, is clinical observation safe? The, the answer. So the symptoms are not the same. Check the prognosis factor to recommend and after is present the uh, pulmonary hypertension send the patient to the intervention. How can you obtain this assessment? Simple physical phonetic second heart sound. Sign of pulmonary congestion and right heart failure. Presence regurgitation. Other exam is simple exam is possible. Pulmonary hypertension. Electrocardiogram is a prognostic factor when right chamber, right chamber overload. In this case here. And the, the intervention. X-ray enlargement at the this is a powerful exam. It's an echocardiogram when they show systolic pulmonary arterial pressure, then millimeters of mercury. mercury. 
in microstenosis, in this prognosis, uh, 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 micro of rheumatic etiology. The other important key in my presentation is importance of etiology and treatment in primary and functional mitosis. In patients with uh, mitral regurgitation, it's necessary for rheumatic prolapse in our country, important. This is therapeutic planning, time of type of intervention. When indicated, can be different according to the cause of mitral regurgitation. In spite of advances in the test, and jet area more than in left atrial area, regurgitant fraction more than effective regurgitant orifice area, it's important to quantify or check the severity surgery or repair valve, repair of valve replacement. Can I can I give a suggestion maybe? Uh, I think Flavio's connection, uh, internet connection, is very poor. Uh, actually, we cannot uh, hear uh, hear his lecture very well. So while he established the new connection, uh, if Greg is is with us, and uh, maybe we'll invite Greg to to replace him, and then we go back to to him again, right? Greg, are are you with us now? Okay, Greg. Uh, so first, let me introduce Greg. Uh, well, he doesn't need any any in, uh, introduce um, introduction because uh, he's very well known, not only as the first author of several different trials, including the COAP trial that is is it's uh, on show tonight. Uh, but Greg is also a great friend of us, and uh, it's been he has been very kind of, of accepting our invitation to be here tonight. So he is uh, the, actually, I have to tell, that he's the, the, the formal director of academic affairs for Mount Sinai Heart, uh, Heart Health System. Greg, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to use your time, and again, we are very, very truly honored uh, to have you here tonight. It's my real pleasure to be able to deliver this talk tonight. I, I wish we were all together. Uh, hopefully, uh, with the uh, widespread uptake of effective vaccines, that can be the case next year. But for now, this is the best thing. So let me share my screen. And let me, okay, application, let me find my talk for you. Here we go. All right, you should be seeing my slides. So assuming you are, let me tell you about the role of transcatheter treatment of mitral regurgitation in patients with heart failure. Uh, these are my disclosures for this talk. So when we talk about patients with heart failure, uh, such patients can develop what we call secondary mitral regurgitation. And we call it secondary mitral regurgitation because it's secondary to left ventricular dysfunction and dilatation. In fact, the mitral valve itself is quite normal until the end stage of the disease. Instead, LV dilatation and dysfunction causes apical and lateral dislocation of the papillary muscles. And the papillary muscles attach, of course, attach to the cords, which attach to the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets. And because they are so geometrically displaced, they, the cords pull on or tether the leaflets so they can't close, they can't approximate um, or coapt. And that's what causes secondary mitral regurgitation. 
So again, the ventricle is really the problem, not the valve. And this is usually caused by either an ischemic cardiomyopathy, where you typically will get a posterior jet, or an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, where you'll most frequently get a central jet. In about 10% of the cases, the cause may be atrial functional mitral regurgitation. Now, in contrast to degenerative or primary mitral regurgitation, where the problem is the valve, in that case, we know that mitral valve repair by surgery gives a very effective repair, long-lasting, durable, and patients have an improved prognosis. But we don't have any evidence that surgical mitral valve repair of secondary mitral regurgitation makes a major prognostic difference. There's no randomized trials of this, but there have been um, a good size perspective and retrospective analyses looking at the outcomes of medically treated patients with heart failure and secondary MR versus surgically treated patients, usually with an undersized annual plastic ring. And there's been no overall difference in major outcomes or mortality. And this is a relatively high uh, morbid and high mortality operation because the patients have reduced ejection fractions and multiple comorbidities. As a response, mitral valve surgery is rarely performed for isolated secondary mitral regurgitation. This is data from the STS registry of 87,000 isolated mitral valve operations over a five-year period. And you can see that only about 4% of these operations are for functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. That's 700 patients per year, which is really nothing when you look at um, a, a, a country as large as the United States. So there's been an interest in developing safer transcatheter approaches to secondary mitral regurgitation. And of course, the one that we have the most experience with is the mitral clip, which creates a bow tie or double orifice repair by basically clipping the anterior and posterior leaflets together. But what's really unknown is that while we know you can do this safely, we don't know, of course, if we will have an effective outcome in patients with secondary MR where the primary problem is underlying left ventricular dysfunction. So, of course, the mitral clip was first tested in the first randomized trial ever of mitral valve therapeutics called the Everest II trial more than a decade ago. And this was a modest sized study of about 279 patients with severe MR, but these were low risk patients. And we didn't really understand back then how different degenerative MR was from functional MR. So the patient population was mixed with about three quarters degenerative arm, MR and one quarter functional MR. And these patients were randomized to two to one to either the mitral clip or control, which back then was considered surgery, which is still, of course, the control for DMR, but not for FMR patients. Now, the mitral clip was certainly safer than surgery. And when you looked at major adverse events in 30 days, it was much, much lower, of course, with the transcatheter approach. Uh, mainly due to a marked reduction in major bleeding and blood transfusions, but there were also a few fewer strokes and fewer deaths and myocardial infarctions. However, the mitral clip was not as effective as mitral valve surgery. There was a lower incidence of achieving mitral regurgitation um, rates of two plus or less and a higher recurrence rate within one year, although mortality was similar. And for this reason, the mitral clip was not approved for a broad treatment of patients with mitral regurgitation, but it was felt to be reasonable for patients, primarily with degenerative MR, who were at too high risk for mitral valve surgery. Now, interestingly, when you looked at all the subgroups from this trial, even though the trial was small, there was only one subgroup that had a positive interaction, and that was whether or not the patients actually had functional or degenerative MR. And in the patients with degenerative MR, both the one-year and five-year outcomes were clearly much better for surgery. But in patients with functional mitral regurgitation, there was no significant difference between surgery and the mitral clip. And if anything, you'll notice the point estimate slightly favored the mitral clip. Um, however, this was a small subgroup, and these were not significantly different from each other. So the real question is, is the mitral clip as good as surgery in these patients, or was neither beneficial because maybe nothing benefits patients with secondary MR? So what we really needed was randomized trials of the mitral clip versus the true control in heart failure patients with secondary MR, which is medical therapy alone. And the largest trial now to look at this is the COAP trial, which I had the honor of, of leading along with Mike Mack. And this was a, um, a large-scale, parallel-controlled, open-label, multi-center trial in 614 patients. 
with heart failure and moderate to severe, severe secondary MR who remain symptomatic despite being on all the highest tolerated doses of heart failure medical therapies and cardiac resynchronization therapy and revascularization if appropriate. And such patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either continue on guideline-directed medical therapy or to have MR reduction with the mitral. So who were these patients? Importantly, um, to understand were the key entry criteria. These patients had ischemic or not ischemic cardiomyopathy, but we didn't want to include either the most healthy or the most sick such patients. So we restricted the left ventricular ejection fractions to 20 to 50%, and we capped the left ventricular end systolic dimension at seven centimeters. So we did not want to include huge, boggy, blown out ventricles where even if they did have severe MR, they might not recover even if you reduce the MR. We required the MR to be severe, either three plus or four plus, according to a multi-parametric assessment using the United States American Society of Echocardiography criteria. And this had to be confirmed in an independent echo core lab before enrollment. Patients had to be symptomatic, again, either um, New York Heart Association class two or ambulatory four, but not bedridden despite a stable, maximally tolerated medical therapy regimen um, and CRT if appropriate. And we had an eligibility committee to make sure that the patients were truly maximally treated and still symptomatic before being enrolled. We also excluded, um, importantly, patients with very severe pulmonary hypertension, greater than 70 millimeters of mercury, unresponsive vasodilators, those with moderate or severe RV dysfunction, and tricuspid regurgitation requiring surgery. Now, as you know, the primary endpoint in the COAP trial was the need for heart failure hospitalizations within 24 months, and this was markedly reduced by treating secondary MR with the mitral clip. And you can see that these curves spread almost immediately from baseline. There was at about a 50% reduction in the need for heart failure hospitalizations from an average of 68% per patient per year to 35.8% per patient per year, p-value of uh, five zeros and a six. So the number needed to treat was only three patients to reduce a heart failure hospitalization. The major secondary endpoint was a combination of um, single leaflet device um, attachment or death or heart transplant or LVAD uh, at one year. And the FDA would have tolerated up to about a 12% occurrence of this that they thought would have been a reasonable trade-off for the benefit of heart failure hospitalizations. But the mitral clip was extremely safe and the adverse event rate was only 3.4%. This is really, as those of you who do mitral clip, you know that this is one of the safest procedures we do in the cath lab. And most importantly, all cause mortality was reduced to two years. You'll note that in the control population, almost half of these patients died at two years. So this is really a desperate patient population, really with a similar prognosis as many cancers. But we reduced that to 29% with the mitral clip. So we didn't eliminate mortality, of course, because we're not affecting the underlying left ventricular dysfunction, but by affecting the and reducing the extra volume overload from secondary MR, we had a 17% absolute reduction in mortality or a number needed to treat of only six patients to save one life. To put this into perspective, if you look at all of our class one guided heart failure treatments, such as beta blockers and allopril, uh, mineral corticoid antagonist receptors, and Tresto, et cetera. It takes about 20 to 50 patients treated for two years to save one life. In contrast, in COAF in the HEFREF population, it was five patients, despite them being on all of those medical therapies. So this is a very, very effective therapy in terms of prolonging life. Now, when we looked at all the different subgroups within COAF, Every single subgroup we looked at had a similar chance of benefiting, whether the patients were young or old, men or women, lower or higher ejection fractions, whether they were low surgical risk or high surgical risk, whether it was an ischemic or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, et cetera. And in addition to the reduction in death or heart failure hospitalization, the progression of left ventricular dysfunction was uh, mitigated. So patients had a less, a much lower need by about two thirds of either requiring an LVAD or a heart transplant. Patients also felt markedly better. If you looked at the change in Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire from baseline to 12 months, 
the control population actually got somewhat worse, whereas the uh, treatment population got markedly better, with five points being a mini minimally clinically important difference. They got 12.5 points better, so a, a group difference of around 16 points, so a huge difference in the way the patients felt. We now have the follow-up data out to three years, and this is the two-year rate of death of heart failure hospitalization, and you can see from two to three years, the curves continue to separate, so now there's a 52% reduction in death or heart failure hospitalization. You can see there's about 10 zeros followed by a one in the p-value, and the reason I show all that is because this is beyond any possibility of statistical chance. The number needed to treat was only 3.4 to prevent a death or heart failure hospitalization within three years. What was unique about this trial also was that at two years, we allowed patients in the control arm who were still alive to cross over and get the mitral clip. So if we take those patients out of the control arm at two years, this is what it looks like, pretty similar. And if we now look at those patients at two years that did cross over and we readjust their timing, to compare it to the mitral clip group at time zero, you can see they really almost immediately start to assume a death or heart failure station hospitalization rate of very similar to the mitral clip treated patients earlier on. So the point here is that it's really never too late when you've got a patient that's still surviving with um, a severe secondary mitral regurgitation to provide benefit to them by reducing that secondary MR with the mitral clip. Now, the reason these patients benefited was the reduction in mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but it shows the um, uh, severity of MR at baseline at 30 days, one year, two years, and three years. And all I'll show you very simply is that if you look here at every time period, the um, uh, reduction in MR was much greater with the mitral clip compared to ongoing medical therapy. And if you look at, importantly, the recurrent rates of severe mitral regurgitation, at all time periods, it's in the low single digits. So the nice thing about this is that the problem with secondary MR is lack of coaptation. And the mitral clip itself causes coaptation. So it addresses the primary problem. So the recurrence rate is very low. In addition, we can directly show you that it's reduction in MR and not anything else that actually led to the improved prognosis. This is the reduction in MR and COAP to 30 days. And you can see at baseline, the two groups had all three or four plus MR. And you can see at 30 days, 93% of the mitral clip treated patients had a uh, um, less than three plus MR. But some of the um, medically treated patients had less than um, three plus MR as well, about a third of them. And this shows that one, this is somewhat regression to the mean, but it also points out the dynamic nature of mitral regurgitation and the fact that some of these patients may have been treated a little bit um, more closely in the trial. When we look at the outcomes from 30 days to two years, according to the re, um, MR grade that was achieved at one month, you can see that patients who achieved an MR grade in, in all patients total of zero to one plus had a, then a one month to 24 month death or heart failure hospitalization rate of 39%. If their MR was reduced to two plus, it was 49.8%, which wasn't significantly different. But if they had recurrent three to four plus MR, they had a much worse prognosis with a 75% practically uh, rate of death or heart failure hospitalization. And of note, this occurred almost with the exact same rates in the mitral clip arm in the left and the medical therapy arm in the right. So the point of this is, it doesn't matter how you reduce the MR, whether it was by chance or by better medical therapy or regression to the mean or by the mitral clip, it's reducing the MR that leads to the better prognosis. It just so happens that that's much more effectively done by the mitral clip than by ongoing medical therapy. You could look at the predictors of clinical response. Um, for example, you could define super responders as those who were alive at two years with no heart failure hospitalizations and a Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire improvement of at least 20 points. Those are super responders. You could define responders as those alive without a heart failure hospitalization and a symptomatic response of five to 20 points. And you could say that anybody else, either dead or heart failure hospitalization, 
or minimal KCCQ change uh, is a non-responder. And of course, you can see that there were many more both responders and super responders in the MitraClip group compared to the medical therapy alone group. The other predictors of responders was achieving a lower MR at 30 days. And here in particular, zero to one plus MR seemed to be even more effective in leading to both super responders and um, all responders taking symptoms into account um, uh, than two plus MR. And also reducing the right ventricular systolic pressure at 30 days. The super responders and responders were more likely to have a lower right ventricular systolic pressure at 30 days than the non-responders. Now, there was one other trial that you all know called MITRA-FR that on its surface looked very similar to COAPT. It was about half the size, performed in France, 300 patients with secondary MR due to LV dysfunction, symptomatic patients, EF of 15 to 40%, who um, were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either the MITRA-CLIP plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. Now, there were differences in the way they defined what severe mitral regurgitation was here. They used the European criteria of um, an EROA of greater than 20 millimeters squared or a regurgitant volume of greater than 30 mLs per beat. And as I've described later, we used a much higher criteria of what severe MR was according to the US criteria in COACT. They also did not require that patients be on maximally tolerated guideline directed medical therapy, and the medical therapy could vary in both arms. Now, in this trial, there was absolutely no difference in either the one year primary endpoint or with extended follow up to two years of the primary endpoint of composite death or heart failure hospitalization between mitral clip or medical therapy. Absolutely no difference. So, what explains? the marked difference between MITRA-FR and COACT, because again, they kind of look the same on um, their face. Well, we think there's really three reasons. And again, probably the most important reason is that given the difference inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, COACT enrolled the patient with substantially more severe MR and without marked left ventricular dilatation. So you could see See, the mean EROA was 31 millimeters squared in MITRA-FR versus 41 millimeters squared in COAP, which is a big difference. In addition, MITRA-FR did not cap how large the left ventricle could be. And they had a left ventricular end diastolic volume index of 135 mils per M squared on average versus 101 in COAP. So the COAP ventricles were moderately enlarged, the MITRA-FR ventricles were markedly enlarged. Now, Grayburn and Packer have emphasized that there's a relationship by the Gorlin equation between the left ventricular and diastolic volume and the EROA. And if you define severe MR as a regurgitant fraction of greater than 50%, which is a common definition, then this line, the blue line, represents that relationship. So if the left ventricular and diastolic volume is large, you need a high MRO, an EROA of around 0.4 to be severe MR. But if you don't have a dilated left ventricle, then a small EROA, say 0.2, could be severe MR. Now, they call this disproportionately severe MR if it's even greater than you would have expected by this relationship. Proportionally severe MR if it's similar, and then non-severe MR is non-severe MR. So proportionally severe MR really just means very severe MR. Proportional, that was disproportionately severe MR. Proportionally severe MR means classic severe MR, and non-severe MR means non-severe MR. Now, very severe MR, you would expect to benefit greatly from MR reduction. Severe MR, you would still expect to benefit from MR reduction, but maybe a little bit less. Non-severe MR, you would not expect to benefit from MR reduction. Now, if you look at the population means, you could see that COAP patients tended to have relatively smaller ventricles and disproportionately severe MR, whereas MITRA-FR patients had much larger ventricles and were on the kind of borderline of having severe MR to non-severe MR. But of course, there is a population of patients around each of these means. So you can see most of the COAP patients were likely very severe MR, where a lot of the MITRA-FR patients were even non-severe mitral regurgitation. So here, for example, are three patients with an EROA of 30 millimeters squared. 
this patient has markedly severe LV dilatation and is likely not going to benefit by MR reduction. He probably needs an, either an LVAD or a transplant or just hospice care. This patient, on the other hand, has a posterior basal aneurysm from an inferior infarct. The overall ventricular size is not even increased. This patient with severe MR is likely to benefit tremendously. And here's a patient who's in between. So it just so happened that Mitrefar enrolled most of these patients, while COAP enrolled more of these patients. So if you look at what the COAP criteria is, which you can take into practice now to identify these patients, we used, a, a, again, a multi-parametric approach with three different tiers. But 86% of the patients were enrolled with either an ERA of at least three centimeters squared or pulmonary venous systolic flow reversal. So if you remember that, that's 86% of the COAP patients. If you got an ERA of 0.2 to 0.3, that's 20 to 30 millimeters squared, you could also have gotten in as long as you have had either one of the following three criteria. And if you had even a lower ERA, there was still a rare chance of getting in if you had two or more of these criteria, but that was unusual. We also remember excluded patients with ejection fractions less than 20% or end systolic dimensions greater than 70 centimeters or seven centimeters and no very severe fixed irreversible pulmonary hypertension or RV failure. And if you look at these three tiers, there was no significant interaction in the overall improvement. In particular, tiers one and tiers two, particularly benefited by the mitral foot. The second reason that we believe COAP succeeded where mitral FR failed was that COAP patients all were failing all maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapies. So really, the medical therapies were kept constant for the most part in COAP in both groups, and that allowed the, uh, the benefit of the MR reduction to be seen. In contrast, in Mitra FR, both groups had up titration of their medical therapies, and we have reasons to believe that this was even greater in the control group than the MitraClip group, which probably minimized the difference between the two groups, because heart failure meds do work in this condition. And finally, uh, it's true, uh, this is not being critical, but it's true that the MitraClip had not been used a lot in France when they performed the Mitra FR trial. In fact, this was the registration trial for the CLIP in France. And so compared to COAP in North America, where the um, uh, uh, mitral clip had been used in five prior studies, um, these acute success rates were lower in mitral FR, the acute complication rates were higher, and the long-term durability was less, in part because they used less clips in mitral FR than COAP. So I think there were some technical reasons, too, why COAP was positive. The bottom line from all of this was that last year, based on a very detailed review of both COAP and Mitra FR, the FDA approved the Mitra clip for treatment of select patients with severe secondary MR who remained symptomatic despite maximally tolerated guideline directed medical therapy. And I won't read you the detailed label, but the bottom line is the FDA really looked at all the COAP data and saw that pretty much every patient benefited. So they said, as long as you follow up the COAP criteria, we're pretty comfortable that you're going to benefit. In addition, the guidelines have started to recognize this now, and these are the most recent updates of the ACCAHA guidelines, and they say for patients who have a severe secondary MR, um, uh, who are remain symptomatic despite uh, revascularization and CRT is appropriate and maximally tolerated medical therapy that TMVR is indicated with an edge-to-edge -edge mitral clip technique. So if I was going to conclude with the implications of the COAP trial, I think very importantly, COAP and mitral FR provide complementary guidance for patient selection, demonstrating which patients with heart failure and secondary MR are likely to benefit, but as importantly, which are unlikely to benefit. Uh, and we don't want uh, patients to be treated if they're not going to benefit. The FDA has approved and guidelines support the MitraClip in patients with heart failure and secondary MR, meaning COAP criteria. Strict reliance to these criteria should allow duplication of the COAP results in the real world and avoid overtreatment. And importantly, the profound beneficial impact of the MitraClip in patients with heart failure, meaning COAP criteria, has important implications for ongoing and future trials investigating new transcatheter mitral valve repair and replacement technologies. So we know that there's, you know, really over 60 different 
mitral valve repair and replacement technologies that are undergoing investigation. And many of these are proved in Europe already. Uh, some of these are edge to edge techniques. Many of them are either direct or indirect angioplasty. A lot of them are mitral valve replacement. And there are a whole bunch of other approaches such as uh, posterior lethal augmentation, neocords, spacers, et cetera. And for all of these devices, the question is going to have to be asked, are they as safe as the mitral clip for secondary MR? Are they as or more effective than the mitral clip? Or, and or, can they treat patients for whom the mitral clip is not suited? So there's going to be a lot of ongoing studies, which is further going to define the important and role, and I believe there will be an important role that will be complementary for many of these devices in the treatment of patients with heart failure and severe secondary MR. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Greg. This was a, th this was a terrific uh, lecture. I think we, uh, you address all the main uh, uh, points about uh, function MR. And now we have uh, time for the discussion. Unfortunately, Flavio, um, its connection is still very poor. And uh, due to the sake of time, uh, it's almost uh, 8, 8 p.m. here in Brazil. And uh, we have to keep the, the program moving. So I'm going to open uh, for the panel discussion and also for um, people from the internet who is also been attending the session and, be, and uh, they're going to be able to make some questions for us. Pedro, do you want to start with some questions maybe or we can call the panel? Pedro? Um, okay. I don't think, uh, I don't know if Pedro is um, hearing, so I'm going to uh, actually start with the panel, uh, uh, giving a chance for everybody to ask a question or make some comment, starting from my good friend, Luis, just because we are going to, uh, turning rounds. Luis is, um, is a heart failure specialist, both here at uh, HMV and uh, at the University Hospital. He's been working together for a long time, he has some experience with mitral clip patients. So Luis, feel free to make some comments and questions. Greg, I think is gonna be uh, happy to, to answer, or even the panel. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein, for the invitation. Uh, and thank you for the nice lecture we have had from uh, Dr. Greg Stone. Uh, I really appreciate this lecture. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of teaching involved, uh, and my I was wondering which question I would make. Uh, and I think the most uh, important point of selecting patients for mitral clip is actually that slide of proportional versus disproportionate MR. And I would ask. Uh, uh, Grad, Dr. Stone, uh, if he would give us some hints or some tricks of how to assess, either by echo or any other device or tool, how to assess if uh, any level of mitral regurgitation is really proportionate or disproportionate, uh, since I think this is the main uh, uh, diagnose uh, information we have to have before we indicate the mitral clip. And, and I will point out it's been impossible to be able to translate this concept of disproportionate and proportionate MR to the individual patient. We've tried, others have tried, uh, because when you look at the Gorlin equation, it, it's also not quite as simple as we showed. It also depends on the left ventricular ejection fraction. It depends on the left atrial pressure. Um, uh, and uh, it depends on the regurgitant volume. So in individual patients, you can't just choose two numbers and calculate a ratio. So I would try to get away from that concept, and at least right now, I would try to think more about the COAP criteria. Uh, so if you use this multi-parametric approach that's recommended by um, the U.S. American Society of Cardiography, and you don't just rely on one single measure, if you have pulmonary venous systolic flow reversal, I can't tell you whether it's necessarily proportionate or disproportionate, but I can tell you it's severe, okay? And it's almost always gonna benefit by MR reduction. Similarly, if you have an EROA of greater than um, uh, three centimeters squared, 0.3 centimeters squared, that is 30 millimeters squared, uh, that will almost always benefit from MR reduction unless you have a terribly dilated left ventricle. 
Um, uh, and again, seven centimeters is for an end, a left ventricular end systolic dimension is a very large ventricle. Uh, but there are some that are eight or nine. And then you're getting into, again, that really blown out phase where those ventricles are not going to recover. So I would get away a little bit from the proportionate and disproportionate concept. And I've talked to Paul Graber a lot about this because both proportionate and disproportionate do benefit. It's the non-proportionate, or so the non-severes that don't benefit. And the non-severes are going to be the patients with 2 plus MR or even 3 plus MR, but with a very severe left ventricular dysfunction, either markedly dilated LV, marked reduced ejection fraction, severe fixed pulmonary hypertension, end-stage right ventricular dysfunction, et cetera. So, as we can see in summary, Greg, um, if you agree, selecting the correct patients based on the uh, MR severity is the key point here uh, to choose the patients who will benefit from this therapy, right? Uh, well, MR severity and LV. And LV. So, right. I you think... You don't want a patient that's got an end-stage left ventricle that can't recover. Sure. Uh, I think uh, Professor Luis Eduardo Rodi now is also a heart failure specialist, echocardiographist, and he's been working with Mitro Clip in Boston before he came back to Brazil, and uh, he wants to make some comments to you as well. I, I just would like to add a, a question to Dr. Stone. Uh, I guess one of the great bar barriers we have here in Brazil is the cost. So um, uh, I, I was very interested in this, this recent paper about super responders. We, we have used this concept to, to uh, um, um, uh, apply to decide which patients would be eligible in Brazil for, for resynchronization re therapy. Uh, uh, would you give us some rinse? Uh, no, the, the microphone is not working. It's okay. No, it's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can hear it perfectly uh, well. Okay, some hints about uh, selection of patients uh, that would be get a super response to, to mitral clip using only baseline data uh, uh, um, before the implant. Uh, so we can even select uh, the, the patients that would get a, a better response. So that's a great, a great question. And the problem is, is that there were really no predictors of baseline, uh, baseline predictors of super responders. All the super responders, the only predictors that we found would be basically how they hemodynamically responded um, uh, or how they echocardiographically responded in terms of MR reduction after treatment. So uh, unfortunately, if you, looked in, um, uh, if you look in the data, I can tell you that the, um, among mitroclip treated patients, the independent predictors of long-term adverse outcomes principally were um, ref right ventricular dysfunction as assessed by either a, a markedly abnormal TAPSI um, or abnormal right ventricular global um, strain or um, markedly elevated pulmonary pressures that um, did not respond to vasodilators. We still had some of those patients that were enrolled. However, those patients still benefited more than the um, control patients did. And there were no interactions from any subgroup that we looked at. So unfortunately, I can, I can tell you who's going to do a little bit more poorly, but all the patients that met COAP criteria benefited to such a degree that I wouldn't want to exclude any of them. And I can't find the baseline predictors that tell you who does not respond. Now, I understand about the cost, but we've estimated that only about 4% of patients with heart failure um, have COAP criteria of severe MR, ejection fraction 20 to 50 percent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think you can, it, it's a very small, narrow subset of all the heart failure patients in Brazil, and that will keep the cost down if you really follow the COAP criteria, but all those patients have a really good chance of benefiting. Great. So before we move to the next question, let me just uh, introduce back Pedro. Uh, Pedro was uh, actually talking to uh, Flavio, who is uh, not having the connection. So Pedro is back. Pedro, if you want to address any questions to Greg or to the panel, please feel free. Then we can move to the next uh, uh, panelist, please. Sure. Yeah. Well, Greg, let me ask you, uh, uh, what type of uh, mitroclip uh, was used uh, in co-op? Uh, 
Was it uh, first generation? And if yes, do you think that the newer generation uh, devices will improve uh, results or uh, broaden up the, uh, the, uh, the uh, number of patients that can benefit on this type of treatment? Yeah, great. Another great question. It was all first generation MitraClip. So, uh, of course, since then, we've got a second generation, we have a third generation, and we have a fourth generation. And I think the fourth generation is a major advance because of the independently uh, moving uh, clips. Uh, so becoming somewhat more than more like Pascal. And of course, the XTR gives you even longer reach and longer length. So I do expect the results to get somewhat better uh, because I, I think that you'll be able to um, more effectively reduce mitral regurgitation. I mean, we had a reduction, an acute reduction in about uh, 80% down to one plus or less. And I, you know, even though we couldn't show a marked difference in prognosis between one plus or less versus two plus, I still think less is better. And the symptomatic benefit was somewhat better with less than one plus, with one plus or less. So I do think these newer devices will lead to somewhat improved outcomes. Yes. Good. Okay, just because we, uh, we started to talk about technical issues, um, I'm gonna call uh, and ask my, my colleague, Filippi. Filippi Valli is a, um, was a recent fellow at uh, Toronto General Hospital, and he, has a lar he had a large experience only training with uh, MitroClip for almost one year, right, Filippi? And he had the chance to work with all the generations, including Gen 4. Uh, so if you want to make a comment about the different of the devices and if you think that this will reflect in any improvement of results using uh, the new generations, what do you think about technical aspects of uh, MitroClip? So first of all, thanks Dr. Weinstein and Dr. Polanski for having me. It is a great pleasure to be here tonight. And I do believe that the new generation of MitroClip, meaning the fourth generation, will expand the indications for transcatheter mitral valve repair. Uh, specifically to Dr. Stone's point, controlled gripper actuation uh, will provide us an opportunity to treat patients with largely thyroid leaflets uh, and degener both degenerative MR as well as ischemic MR with large uh, vena, con vena contracta and very severe MR. Uh, if you allow me, Dr. Reinstein, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Stone to make a comment on COAPT. Uh, Dr. Stone, uh, Dr. Hori, who made you a previous question, as well as Dr. Becky de Silva, are heart failure specialists. In COAPT, in contrast to MitraFAR, it was mandatory to have to be seen by a heart failure specialist. And I do believe that heart failure specialists are the main characters in this game. So uh, you clearly pointed out that in COAPT, you needed to you to you needed to have maximally tolerated GDMT, whereas in MitraFAR that was not exactly the case. So if you can please give us your considerations about the role of heart failure specialists in the selection of patients who might benefit the most from transcatheter mitral valve repair, that would be very grateful. Sure. So, you know, this disease is heart failure. This primary disease is not mitral regurgitation, it's heart failure. And so the, the center, the nexus of the treatment um, team should be a heart failure specialist. And uh, that could be somebody who is actually board certified in heart failure, uh, or it could be a cardiologist that spends most of his time and energy taking care of heart failure patients. But there's no doubt that the heart failure specialist is going to get better outcomes for these patients than the non-heart failure specialists. They'll be an expert at uh, when and how to use, you know, the uh, um, uh, newer agents such as the uh, Arnie's and of course the Glyphosins now uh, and how to get the most out of those drugs with minimizing side effects. And again, if the patients can be br brought asymptomatic by heart failure medications and by the judicious use of uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy when appropriate, then right now we don't have a reason that the asymptomatic patient um, should undergo MitraClip. They're not gonna feel better if they're asymptomatic, if they're truly asymptomatic. Um, uh, it's possible they'll live longer, but we need to have that proven in another randomized trial. Um, the heart failure specialist will also, you know, do a much better job in knowing which patients will benefit from an implantable defibrillator, et cetera. So the heart failure um, specialist,
should be able to manage the patient first. And then, similar to the general cardiologist with coronary artery disease, when the patient remains symptomatic despite a really good trial of heart failure medications, CRT, revascularization if indicated, et cetera, then refer for a possible mitral foot treatment. Okay. Perfect. Ho, oh, um, I think it's your time to make a question. Ho is also being involved in mitral clip. He's been doing some procedures. He's also at, um, uh, ba uh, his basics is with ch uh, children uh, disease, heart, uh, heart disease in children, but he's moved back to some structural heart disease as well. So please. Uh, hi. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Stone, for the, uh, for the great lecture. Now I uh, see you talking about the co-op. I can, could understand how co-op uh, microclip sailed through FDA. Um, I have two simple questions from since we are kind of struggling here with our initial experience with mitral clip, price is a big uh, issue on that. Um, first of all, uh, do you have any cases in the co-op or in the cohort of uh, atrioceptal devices and how difficult uh, the procedure could be with such devices since uh, transeptal puncture is a great um, importance in the whole procedure, the position of septal puncture. And yeah, the, no, no. Uh, patients that had prior um, atrial septal procedures or that had large atrial septal aneurysms, et cetera, were excluded from the trial. Right. Uh, so that is an important technical consideration, but I can, and, and of course, the appropriate atrial puncture site can make the uh, mitral clip procedure either very simple or very difficult. Uh, very skilled uh, operators can get by and certainly have done many procedures in patients in whom either a PFO or an ASD has been closed, but it would make it more difficult. And the uh, second question is um, moving towards the future and uh, probably we'll have uh, percutaneous valves or devices such as Tendine uh, in our midst. Uh, say that uh, a f late failure of mitral clip. Do you think those patients could be, uh, should be excluded for uh, these new forms of therapy or perhaps we still can use these new valves in those patients if they fail? Well, so that's the, the one that I would say is probably the most important limitation of the mitral clip is that it is a permanent device um, and it really precludes other therapies such as transcatheter mitral valve replacement. It doesn't preclude surgical mitral valve replacement, um, but you'd have to cut out the mitral clip. Um, people have played with and tested electro-surgical or electro type techniques like Lampoon um, to try to excise the mitral clip, but that's kind of under development right now. Um, so right now, that's the major limitation. So you wouldn't be able to do tendine with a, with a transapical approach at least not very easily. Um, and I've not heard of a case done where through the transapical approach, the mitral clip could be cut out and removed, although perhaps that's possible. Uh, but again, for now, I would tend to think that if you're gonna use a mitral clip, you're pretty much precluding transcatheter mitral valve replacement in most patients. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, I think that uh, Rodrigo has some questions from the audience. Uh, Rodrigo. Please. Actually, uh, we have at this point no question in the chat, but uh, I do have a question for Greg. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, I was thinking here, uh, uh, reimbursement is uh, really a problem here for MitoCrip in Brazil. I was wondering if Greg has some, um, some input about uh, cost effectiveness of MitoCrip uh, to give us? Sure. So, um, you know, we've published the data and the costs are definitely increased in mitral clip patients, largely because of the cost of the device. And it's, it's very expensive here in the United States as well. Um, we've had um, uh, issues as well with reimbursement with the mitral clip. Uh, it was initially reimbursed for, again, patients with degenerative mitral regurgitation who were at prohibitive surgical risk. And so it was used in a relatively small number of patients. Uh, it's about to be reimbursed in the United States for secondary or functional MR. 
which will be five times or more as many patients. But it's taken a long time for the U.S. government to work through that process because they know that's going to be expensive. Um, we actually expected that approval like six months ago, but COVID has, closed, has slowed everything down, and, and we expect that approval pretty much any day now. So it's going to happen. Um, in terms of cost effectiveness, it's, it's cost effective in that the reduction, in, we, we published, David Cohn's group published the data on cost effectiveness, and it is cost effective, although it does increase costs. Uh, but with the marked reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, that offsets some of the cost. And of course, the marked reduction in mortality makes it cost effective. Um, so you've got to figure out how to try not to withhold it because of cost. But I know that's easier said than done, and you, you've just got to petition, you know, the government and private insurance companies to pay for it for the right patients, uh, because the benefits are pretty marked. Okay, that's a good, very, very good point, because um, the, the costs and the, the cost effectiveness is a big uh, problem all, all over the world, especially in in, uh, in countries like Brazil, as you know. Um, uh, before you, we move to the next question, we still have a lot of, like, five minutes to go. Uh, I'd like to see your opinion, Greg. Um, you, you've been talking, you've been uh, uh, giving some um, hints about the ratio between uh, LV dilation and uh, the severity of mitral regurgitation to, sell, to better select the patients, right? Uh, there was a publication uh, not a uh, long time ago that established some um, cut point of 0.13 as a ratio of, uh, between the RA, a, AROA and the LV, um, LV uh, diastolic volume. Uh, if the patient has greater than 0.13, uh, he would do better with mitroclip than patients who has less than 0.13. Do you have any special opinion about this cut point? Do you think this has to be better validated or, or is easy to, yeah. uh, ready to be used? Yeah, it doesn't really work. Um, uh, you know, first of all, if you looked at, quote, the utility of that cut point in the paper, the C statistic is very low. Uh, and there have been about a half dozen other papers that have looked at this, quote, ratio, and it doesn't work in individual patients. So as a concept, it works, but as individual patients, it doesn't. It's kind of like saying that older patients have a worse prognosis than younger patients, but that doesn't mean at a cutoff of age 75, you can decide patients should or should not be treated. You have to look at each individual patient um, and understand the individual risks and benefits. Uh, and it's same for, for that value. So I don't think um, it's a very useful ratio to look at in an individual patient. Rather, I would try to get a sense of how severe is the MR and how bad is the left ventricle. And I actually think that the gestalt is better than a hard number. Um, the worse the MR, the relatively better the ventricle in terms of both function and uh, less dilatation, the better the patient is going to do okay. with MR reduction. We have uh, only uh, three or four minutes more, and uh, I'd like to hear uh, uh, Rogério also has a question, but before he, f and then he, he can finish, just because we are following the order, uh, Dr. Sari, who is also a surgeon, uh, he does mitre clip but also operates patients. So we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, doing mitral clip and mitral repair. So uh, Dr. Sadi, do, do you want to make uh, probably some points about how, how you, if you had to operate a patient with a severe heart failure, low ejection fraction, what kind of surgery you would perform? We know that repair is the best option for patients with primary MR, MR with uh, degenerative MR, but we know that probably this is not a case for uh, secondary MR. Uh, yes, Marco, I think uh, Dr. Greg uh, Stone uh, nicely shown us that uh, surgery is not a very good option in a secondary MR, and uh, for sure transcatheter therapies are, are better than surgery. And there are some uh, data that show that uh, if you need to operate on a, a patient with a, a severe secondary MR, MR together with another procedure is better to do maybe a mitral valve replacement than, than a repair. Uh, what I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Stone is uh, how does he see uh, in the near future uh, the, the use of the transcatheter mitral valve and mitral clip? Uh, 
uh, which patients uh, would benefit most with mitral creep and uh, which patients would uh, benefit uh, more with a, a transcatheter mitral valve? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And that's a, a, the billion dollar question for all the companies that are developing transcatheter mitral valve replacement systems. Uh, you know, because um, uh, there were many people that, that thought COAPT was gonna be positive. There were many that thought it was gonna be negative but nobody thought it was gonna be as positive as it was. Uh, we were surprised, I was surprised, Mike Mack was surprised. We were all surprised it was as positive as it was. Um, so there really was a tremendous benefit in um, reducing MR to the extent that we did, um, uh, and we did it very safely, and that's really the key. Transcatheter mitral valve replacement, I think no doubt is going to be more effective at eliminating MR. It should eliminate MR in 90 plus percent of the patients. It'll be better than the mitral clip. So the question is how much more effective will that be in improving the long-term prognosis? And what's the trade-off in terms of the acute procedural risks of the very large device and occasional left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and occasional paravalvular leak with hemolysis and the need to anticoagulate perhaps for three to six months or longer. Um, so you're gonna have a technique that's perhaps more effective, but also more risky. And we're only gonna be able to tell in head-to-head -head trials. Um, and which patients may benefit better with one versus the other, I can't tell you yet, except for there are certainly anatomic patients that are not eligible for mitral clip treatment. Um, Saibel Carr, who's perhaps, I've asked him this, who's perhaps arguably the best mitral clip operator in the universe, um, I asked him, what percentage of patients with secondary MR do you think that you can correct with the mitral clip? And he said he thought 70 to 75%. So even in his hands, there's a quarter that can't be approached by the mitral clip uh, because they either have too great a co distance or depth, or there's two, just a multiple different defects, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, or there's a, a cleft that's associated or another factor. Uh, so for those, transcatheter mitral valve replacement will likely be a much better option. For the ones that are eligible for both, we're just going to need a head-to-head -head trial to find out if uh, the benefits of transcatheter mitral valve um, replacement overcome its limitations. I will let Rogério ask a question, then Pedro will, uh, and Pedro will uh, finish the session after Rogério makes his uh, final question, please. Thank you, Mark. We will almost be running at time. But Greg, congrats, superb presentation. We already learned from you. I have a, a very a, a question that's related to clinical practice. Here in Brazil, we have a huge problem regarding the waiting list of the heart transplantations. Do you think that in the clinical perspective, for like a health issue politics, the mitral clip could be an option for the patients who are on the waiting list for heart transplantation because sometimes you have some very remote regions, people uh, are not uh, the, 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 uh, trained to perform and select patients for heart transplantation, so the, the people do, do not know how to handle this kind of disease. So the fact that can bring in, pulling people out from the waiting list with the mitral clip? Yeah. So that's a great, great question, and that also would make it more cost effective. Uh, so that's one of the designs that I had for a future COAP trial was the patients who are NYHA 4B, basically bedridden or on a list to get an LVAD or on a waiting list for transplant. And of course, there's a great shortage of hearts in the U.S. as well. Um, uh, we don't have that trial funded yet, but short of that, there was just a registry um, of approximately 125, 150 patients, as I recall, that was just presented at TCT a few weeks ago that looked at a variety of these very high-end patients that were treated with the mitral clip um, uh, just, you know, in an observational study. And as I recall, approximately 25 or 30 percent of the patients that were on a transplant waiting list came off the list. They improve substantially and their LF ventricular function improves sufficiently to be removed from the list. And in other patients who were listed as possible bridge to decision, the mitral clip stabilized them so they could actually be put on a list or could go and receive an LVAD where they were too sick previously. So I do think there's gonna be a role for the mitral clip in these very um, end stage patients. And I do think that it looks like a quarter of a third of them may be able to get off of the transplant list
just be treated with the mitroclip, and that, of course, would be life-saving as well as uh, resource conserving. Okay, so you're right on time. Uh, uh, before I'm going to move to Pedro to give us his final comments and words, I have to say thanks again uh, from, the, uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, Greg. That was very, very kind of you to, uh, to deliver this lecture. Uh, we all learn a lot, always learn a lot uh, from you. I used to say directly to you that you are a guideline in person because uh, there is no issue, there is no topic uh, that you don't know the data or the exact number by heart. So thanks again. Uh, thanks for being uh, kind and staying all the time with us for answering the questions. Uh, we're going to have a lecture by uh, um, Scott Lim very soon and, and Fabio you know very well, very well Fabio, um, uh, Fabio Brito is going to present a case, very, very interesting case. If you could attend uh, and discuss, it would be great, but I cannot, uh, I don't know if you are available. Otherwise, uh, thanks really, really a lot. Pedro, please, uh, please finish the session for us and, uh, and we're going to move on. Marco, I have to thank you and, and, and Greg. I uh, had a great time. I learned a lot. I, I, I think that everybody has learned too. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you both Marco and Pedro. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. And uh, let's move to the next session, please.
Good evening. We are now back live to Hospital Mui Juventus. I am with my dear friend, Dr. Eduardo Sade, who is going to help me to co-moderate this session. It will be my pleasure to, to have some, a good friend, a very dear friend, that you are now moving from New York to Virginia. And then first, we're going to, going to have a presentation, a nice presentation from a dear friend, Scott Lim. He's the medical director of the University of Virginia Advanced Cardiac Valve Center. So, uh, and then after, we're going to have a case presentation by our friend, Dr. Fabio Brito in Sao Paulo. And then following this, we're going to have a, a panel here. We're going to discuss both presentation and the clinical, and the clinical case. So, Scott, can you show, please, uh, him on the screen? And... Uh... Yes, uh, hello, Rogerio. Yeah, Good hi, Scott. Can you hear me? I hope all, all is well there in, uh, in with my friends in Brazil. Yeah, we are, here. and we are here. We are very good here, and now see you much better. <laughs> it's gonna, right. it's gonna be a big pleasure and an honor to have you here with us. Maybe next time in person. <laughs> yes, I hope so. Uh, hopefully, the life will go back to something different than this pandemic currently is. So please uh, go ahead, and uh, Dr. Scott Lim is going to talk about a new catheter-based option for mitral and tricuspid disease. Excellent. Thank you, and good evening to all of you, my colleagues. I'm getting to share with you what I see is the future of transcatheter valve technology focusing on mitral and tricuspid valve disease, and I'll give you my predictions as to the future uh, of this. Um, I'll start talking about mitral valve disease and the different primary or secondary types of MR and the different therapies and then even valve replacement. And then we'll rotate over to talk about tricuspid valve disease. So when I first started in transcatheter mitral valve repair back probably close to 20, 15 years ago or more, we really lumped all the mitral valve disease into one bucket. And then with time, we got a little smarter. We realized, no, there was primary or degenerative valve disease, and then there's secondary or functional. And now we're getting smarter yet, and we're really looking back and realizing that Alain Carpentier and his classification scheme really broke it out into type 1, 2, 3A, 3B disease, and each one of them deserves different attention. Uh, and whether we do repair or replacement or how we even do repair, really focuses on what the underlying pathology is. Because if you have primary or degenerative mitral valve disease, if you treat the valve, the patient does really well. But in secondary, functional uh, Carpentier classification 3B, if you treat the valve alone without thinking about the ventricle, you're not going to help the patient as much. And that's what we really found, as Greg showed in the Mitra FR study, as compared to compared to the COAP study, where patients first had intensive medical therapy of their ventricle, and that potentiated the later treatment of their mitral valve disease. And that's going to be even more important when we get into valve replacement. So my predictions on the future are sort of based on where we're at now. For primary degenerative mitral valve disease, Carpentier type 2, prolapse or flail, surgical repair, status as a gold standard for low surgical risk patients or even those with higher risk but more complicated disease. We have then done transcatheter mitral valve repair in first high surgical risk patients with a mitral clip. We have additional devices that are building off the success of the mitral clip that involve edge to edge therapy. One is the Pascal device in the far right there, which is not just edge to edge, but also incorporates a spacer. And we also have a Chinese device now entering the scene called the Dragonfly device. And increasingly, we have other technologies like portal replacement from uh, Gore's pipeline device, as well as the valve replacement options. Currently, in my country and many countries, that transcatheter repair with a mitral clip is reserved for those patients at very high surgical risk. But we are starting a trial called the Repair MR trial, which is looking at patients with lower intermediate risk group or higher and directly comparing them with surgical valve repair. We're also looking and just starting the early feasibility study with cortical replacement in low surgical risk patients because the idea, as Greg pointed out, all these other devices are permanent and would get in the way of a subsequent valve replacement. But if, as you can see on the far bottom left, 
you're doing a transcatheter cordal replacement, those cords are exactly what the surgeons would do at time of surgery. So it doesn't burn any surgical bridges and allows you to do something later on. So that can be done in low surgical risk patients, which we're trying to study them. On the other end of the spectrum is the patients that are non-surgical and not clippable or not suitable for a clip, particularly because they may have mitral annular calcification or some degree of MS. And that's where we're looking right now at the transcatheter mitral valve replacement trials, which I'll tell you about a little more in a moment. But so why do I predict all these things? Well, when you look at the data, and the most recent probably comes from on the MitraClip side from the EXPAND study, which we published uh, recently and was presented at the ACC in March, is looking at a real world basis over a thousand patients done consecutively with the MitraClip and an independent echo core lab adjudicating the outcomes, as you can see here, that probably 95% of them get to a target of two plus or less. Now, more and more, we know two plus may not be ideal, and therefore, we're looking at them, that fully 82% get to one plus. That's zero or mild residual MR after a mitral clip. This is a real-world cohort of patients, so it's more all comers, not just a very strictly defined by a study. And also then the class study, which is on the right here, which is with the Edwards-Pascal device which is a little bit different. It still grabs both leaflets, but has a central spacer. And it's also a more flexible device. The results from that, even in this early feasibility study with uh, operators who are at the beginning of their learning curve with the device, 100% of them were able to achieve two plus or less and also 82% to zero to one plus. So similarly, very good results here. So when we go back to the original Everest II trial, which essentially thought showed that in lower risk patients wasn't as good as surgery. If you look on the right side of the slide, it shows you the results in terms of MR reduction going out to five years. And at five years, yeah, that holds true. Surgery did a better job of achieving less residual MR and maintaining that than did the mitral clip. But if you look on the left side of the slide, their mortality curves are no different. They're indistinguishable. And as you can see here, following those same patients out from Everest two out to five years, there was essentially no difference in their terms of their symptomatology. So even though surgery reduced the MR better, patients didn't live longer, they didn't feel better. So this gives us more impetus now that we follow these patients out farther to study these transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge therapy in even lower risk strata of patients. And that's why we've embarked on the repair MR trial. So, when we instead look at secondary or functional mitral valve disease, I think as Greg pointed out really uh, from the clinical trial of COAP, that guideline-directed medical therapy is important. All patients should be on that first because it not only screens out the patients that once they're on medical therapy at appropriate doses, their MR gets better, it also seems to potentiate the benefit from a mitral clip. And then after that, yes, a mitral clip has a role. We're studying whether Pascal or Dragonfly devices also similarly relate a, a excellent benefit as well. There's been a number of uh, clinical trials now being embarked on annuloplasty in this disease, and I'll show you more about that, as well as even taking the annuloplasty ring subvalvular in the ANCORA trial. And also we're trying to sort out the risk benefit of transcatheter mitral valve replacement in this group of patients, because on one hand, you get a more complete elimination of the MR, but probably at some cost in terms of safety. Why I give you these predictions? Well, as Greg pointed out, all of this data comes from COAP and shows a marked difference in terms of keeping these patients living longer and out of the hospital and feeling better if they get a mitral clip on top of guideline-directed medical therapy and putting that in context of the other mortality benefits from therapies for uh, heart failure reduced EF, as you can see the beta blockers and the ACE inhibitors and so forth. The data from COAP shows that a mitral clip gives an excellent decrease in mortality benefit here. Another way of looking at that is the number needed to treat to prevent one death. And as Greg showed that COAP had a number needed to treat of five. And putting that into context, comparing to another very disruptive therapy like TAVR had a number needed to treat of four. But the difference, as you can see on the left side of the screen, is TAVR had an initial benefit out to a year. And then after that, the curves remained fairly flat. Mitchlip, on the other hand, up to the first year, there wasn't much of a benefit. And that's 
perhaps why my JFR failed because they initially followed people out to only a year. But after a year, between year and year two and year three, the curves continue to diverge, showing that there is a continued benefit in terms of MR reduction in this disease process with the mitral clip. So, but that's not the only thing out there. And our surgical colleagues, as you can see here, tended to use annuloplasty as a mainstay of their therapy, in addition to a bunch of other things in their toolbox. And so a number of companies have tried to approach or tried to mimic doing an annuloplasty with a transcatheter approach. And even when you do an edge-to-edge -edge therapy, as Alfieri showed, that there's potentially a benefit in terms of durability by using a concomitant annuloplasty. So someday I think we're really going to get to like being a surgeon where we have multiple tools that we're using in a complementary fashion. Although the advantage of a transcatheter approach is you can do them serially. You can first go in and do a mitral clip. And if that works great, and if it doesn't work well enough for the long term, you can later go back in and do an annual passy. And the far right shows a case example of doing a um, cardia band annual passy device. That particular case was done at the same time as mitral clip. And so here's a little bit more about that annual plastic device called a cardioband. It's delivered from a transvenous, transeptal approach. And then you anchor down this band with using up to 17 anchors around the mitral annulus, and then you're able to cinch that tight. So essentially achieving a rigid annual plastic ring effect. And from a transcatheter approach, it had a very favorable safety profile. The survival going out to two years was excellent. And the results in terms of reduction of MR showed that it was sustained out to two years. And that's because we were reducing the annulus in size. And once we're shrinking it down there, it stayed that way. I think one of the challenges of this device is, as I mentioned before, while it seems to get good results, you have to anchor down up to 17 different anchors. And so that takes a while. So it still isn't as efficient a procedure as ultimately we need it to become. Another device, which from the get-go has less anchors and so perhaps lends itself to greater efficiency, is the millipede device. It also, as you can see here, has an integrated intracardiac echo catheter to allow you to visualize how you're anchoring it down at different places around the annulus. It was studied in your country, also in Paraguay, in an early feasibility study. And while there was no mortality at 30 days and few major adverse events, the results have not yet been adjudicated by independent echo core laboratory. So I think as Boston Scientific has now purchased the millipede device and is gearing up for a larger trial, we look forward to seeing the outcome uh, in that more rigid type of study. So another device that also works in annuloplasty, but slightly different, is the Ancora device. And it was designed initially to be placed just below the mitral valve to work for functional MR. And it did, and I'll show you that. But in turn, we've also found that if we place this, which is delivered, as you see here, by a transarterial across the aortic valve approach by a tracker catheter and then a bunch of anchors into the left ventricular myocardium, it can also be placed farther down in the ventricle and have direct benefits in a cardiomyopathic state without significant functional MR. And so we initially studied in three different trials for those with functional MR, for those who um, had just heart failure, and for those patients who had previously treated and failed treatment of their MR with another type of device like a mitral clip or even surgery. And the data is the most exciting in the patients who have just heart failure. And so we're now pivoting to starting a pivotal trial in those patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. So more to come on that. But where are we with transcatheter mitral valve replacement? Well, there's transapical devices and transeptal devices. The transapical devices are certainly easier to design and easier to deploy, and the transeptal devices are taking a little bit longer road to get there because they're more complex in their delivery systems. Um, I think transapical devices certainly have demonstrated, and even in the early feasibility study, their role in complex mitral valve disease, including with NAC, as you can see here. Um, and the two designs that have gone the farthest and now are in randomized clinical trial are the 10-9 device in the summit trial on the left, which is interesting. I just finished doing a case a few hours ago. It's delivered transapically. 
it is deployed almost in the left atrium and pulled down to anchor atrially on top of the mitral valve and secured to the apex by a tether and a pad. And the advantage of that is you don't have to worry about hooks and barbs and ways to anchor it. And so even in patients with significant mitral annular calcification or mitral stenosis, this has been done. The other valve on the right is the intrepid valve from Medtronic. It's being studied in the Apollo trial. It too, in its current iteration, is delivered from a transeptal approach, although it already has migrated to a transeptal delivery system, which is being studied in an early feasibility study. So both of these designs are being studied in mitral annular calcification. And this is a very difficult disease process to get your hands around, even to treat, because MAC essentially is there's a wide spectrum of MAC. And certainly in its most severe forms, it causes particular difficulties for our surgical colleagues to be able to sew in a um, surgically implanted valve. But as you can see here, we've had particular success with a transcatheter tendine type valve that doesn't require you to anchor in it, but can be pulled down into the mitral calcification. So that clinical trial is underway now. There, as I mentioned, is transeptal variants. And here's a couple examples, the intrepid, the cardio valve, the evoke valve, which we've had experience with all of these. Uh, and there's a few others that are out there. They're all in earlier stages of their clinical trials as the process of getting them to be delivered, to orienting them to the valve, to anchoring them in position is that much more complex. But particularly in functional MR with a cardiomyopathic ventricle, there is a real value to not going transapically to deliver a valve. So more to come on those. Now, if we pivot over to the tricuspid valve, you know, Certainly, I always have to say, surgical care for almost anything remains a gold standard in low surgical risk patients. But in tricuspid valve disease, most patients are not low surgical risk because the act of having severe TR usually means the right ventricle is dysfunctional, and that's a risk for surgery. And also the liver has in various stages of dysfunction, which can impair the patient's ability to recover from surgery. So the reality is most patients don't have surgery for tricuspid valve disease. And we're studying a lot of different options, um, as including all the same players, the MitraClip, the Pascal device, the Evoke valve, the CardioBand. We're studying them on the tricuspid valve as well. We're also trying to learn what's the right thing to do for patients with tricuspid valve disease. Here's an example of a patient with severe MR that is complicated by severe TR, and our surgical colleagues know that you cannot leave the tricuspid valve alone. But certainly there's sometimes we've found, because we only had the option of treating the mitral valve, that you can treat the mitral valve alone. But then there's other times when we really need to do like what this shows here, where a patient where serially we first did a mitral clip, and then because the patient had severe TR, there was right to left shunning across the ASD when we were done with the mitral clip, so we closed the ASD with a device. And then at a later date, brought the patient back to repair the tricuspid valve with a cardioband. And you can see here that patient even had that done despite having a trans tricuspid valve pacing leak. So there's a lot of potential for this for the future. One of the challenges is guiding tricuspid valve interventions because all the mitral interventions are for the most part guided by a trans esophageal echocardiogram. And that esophagus is in line with the mitral valve, so it makes imaging it beautiful. But the tricuspid valve is off axis to the uh, esophagus, and therefore gets inconsistent imaging, particularly because of shadowing of the septal leaflet by the aortic root. And the septal part of the annulus is difficult to image, particularly when you're doing an annuloplasty type technique. So we had to figure out new solutions, and one of our early solutions is shown here. We took a pediatric, well, actually even a neonatal TEE probe covered it in a sterile sleeve and stuck that in the jugular vein, it had to be a 26 branch sheath to do it, and ran that down to the right atrium. With that jury-rigged approach, we were then able to create these images on the right, as you can see here, compared to the standard TE, we we're able to better image the tricuspid valve, even keep up with the temporal resolution of those leaflets. That would then more successfully guide these interventions on the tricuspid valve. But that's not a standard solution. Ultimately, we need to have better options, including this is an example by a company I've been working with called Nuvera, which has a four-dimensional intracardiac echo probe that allows you to see in real time with much greater clarity 
the tricuspid valve. And it's technologies like this as it comes forward that is going to help us with these tricuspid interventions. But currently, the options are this for the tricuspid valve. You can simply take a mitral clip and use it off-label on the tricuspid valve. I've certainly done that. We did about 38 such cases before I have to say I got too frustrated with doing it because it just isn't designed to take the curves from the IVC over to the, the tricuspid valve. Um, so we, after 38 cases, we sort of stopped doing that. But since then, uh, Abbott Vascular has developed a tricuspid specific delivery system called the TriClip. It's being studied in a triluminate study, and the delivery system makes it much better. It's still the same clip, but it, you can able to articulate it and get it there where you want it to go on the tricuspid valve. And that's being studied in a randomized clinical trial right now. Uh, we also have that Pascal device, which I told you about from Edward's Life Sciences. It's similarly being studied, and even replacement with such as an example of the Evoke valve there. So the Cardia band was, is one that we have had a fair bit of experience with doing on clinical trial there. And similarly to use on the mitral valve, we go around the annulus of the tricuspid valve and we anchor down up to 17 different anchors. And we've got to make sure that we're anchoring into good tissue there because on the right side of the heart, the tissue is a lot thinner. And then, as you can see here, before we, we've anchored it all down and then after we've anchored it, we tighten the cinching mechanism and it shrinks down. And in a number of patients we've seen, just like you can see here in our very first patient, pretty impressive results, taking very torrential grades of TR down to very mild grades and having impressive symptomatic improvements in those patients. Right now, though, uh, Edwards has taken a pause on it as they try and redesign the anchors so that it becomes a more efficient procedure with less anchors. But the early feasibility study was presented by uh, my Carly, colleague, Charlie Davidson, and showed here that the safety outcomes were excellent. There was one case labeled as right coronary obstruction. The reality is you know, that probably wasn't obstructed. You get these kinks in the right coronary artery that if you wait a period of time, they tend to, um, to ease on out and not be so much of a problem. But the efficacy, as we can expect, is pretty good, but not perfect. We don't reduce TR to zero, but we do reduce it significantly. I think part of that speaks to that it's not just the tricuspid valve, it's intimately connected to the right ventricle, which in these cases is oftentimes dysfunctional too. The patients improve symptomatically in every which way we try and look at them. So I think I've really been impressed that even if we reduce the TR a little bit, the patients can have a significant clinical benefit that it translates to. So as I said, the, one of the first ones is when Abbott redesigned the delivery system for the MitraClip and called it a TriClip. And the, he, in the early feasibility study so far, as you can see here, a little more than half the patients were able to reduce the degrees of TR down to mild and moderate grades. But even those that were reduced from the torrential to still severe, those patients symptomatically seem to be doing better. Um, I'm not yet convinced that the triclip is the best device there for the tricuspid valve, as, as you can see by the results in terms of TR reduction. The Pascal device is a little bit behind it in terms of how far along in the clinical trial, but the results from the early feasibility study seem to be a bit higher, 85% getting to one or two plus residual TR, and perhaps that's because the device itself is broader and it also has, incorporates the spacer element. Uh, here's an example from one of our cases with the Pascal device and the tricuspid. We do a lot of transgastric imaging to tell us the orientation of the device within the tricuspid valve. And then in this particular case, as you can see here, the pre versus post, we had an excellent result with trivial residual TR that on the transthoracic discharge and follow-up echoes, we couldn't see any TR. Um, there's also the whole concept of, well, why not just replace the tricuspid valve? And one of the first valves for us to do this with has either been this evoke valve, although we've also been involved with the intrepid valve in the tricuspid position. Um, this evoke valve is delivered by a very impressive delivery system that you're able to articulate it in a very millimeter increments. It uh, comes in a number of sizes, 44, 48, and there's now coming a 52 millimeter valve. Um, as I said, the delivery system is pretty nice. It's a relatively low profile 28 French, uh, which can be done percutaneously. Some of the other valves like Navigate initially were in the 40 French range, which really had to be done from a transatrial approach. I think this is a true um, percutaneous approach for the Evoke valve. 
And here's an example of a case we did not long ago, as you can see, a uh, severe torrential TR. It's delivered from transvenous approach, and it's able to articulate through the right atrium. The first step is bringing out those um, elements, the anchors, to grab each part of the valve. And then we use echo very carefully to look around the valve by multiplanar reconstruction to make sure we're grabbing all the leaflets with those anchors. And then once we have done that, we can simply expand the valve, as you can see here, and it continues to expand more fully. Uh, the heart is beating, cardiac output is not impaired at all as we're doing it, so we're finally able to release the valve here. As you can see, this patient, it was done who already had a trans tricuspid pacing lead, and this valve does not interfere with that. Uh, even once it's fully released. Uh, here's the echo images and uh, had a very nice result with complete abolishment of the tricuspid regurgitation there. So I think tricuspid valve replacement from a transcatheter approach is probably, we're gonna be using it more for those patients with wider gaps in the tricuspid valve, for those patients that have pacemaker leads that may be uh, tethering down a leaflet, it's hard to do an edge to edge therapy with that. But we still have some concerns in terms of access routes, the size of the delivery system, as well as thrombosis and durability of it. Certainly those patients with, we put in a new valve in the tricuspid position are gonna to need to be on anticoagulation to preserve durability of that valve. So, but it's an exciting time to be involved with all this new tricuspid and mitral stem. So there's multiple other valves. It's not just the Evoke, but the Intrepid. There's a Chinese Lux valve and a Jose Navia's Navigate valve are also all being studied too. Um, we're learning a lot. We're learning how to implant them, even with, as I said, trans uh, venous pacing leads. And I think uh, so the future is going to be very bright here. So, with that, thank you all. I'll stop the sharing of my screen and open up to the next part of this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Squatlin. <clears throat> Excellent uh, presentation. You showed almost uh, all the solutions uh, on transcatheter treatment of uh, mitral and tricuspid valve. Uh, I, I would ask uh, kindly if you, if you could stay uh, for the discussion at the end of the session. Uh, so I'd like to, to go, thanks. So I'd like to go straight away to Dr. Fabio. Is Dr. Fabio online? Dr. Fabio. Are you? Are Hello, Sadi. So, Fabio, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Dr. Fabio is a good friend of all of us uh, here in uh, Porto Alegre. He's uh, one of the pioneers in uh, structural heart interventions here in Brazil. He's got a lot of experience in all uh, mitral and aortic and uh, other sort of uh, structural valve uh, uh, heart treatments. So Dr. Fabio is uh, the coordinator of uh, the Heart Institute, uh, Structural Heart uh, Disease, and he's going to present a, a case, and we're going to discuss, uh, Fabio, if you, if you agree during your case presentation, uh, some uh, details of, of your uh, patient. So please, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. And Scott, feel free to, to get in the discussion also, please. Yes. So, can you hear me, Sadi? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to say good evening to my good friends from Moinhos. It's a great pleasure for me to be together with you tonight. Uh, thanks for the organization committee for having me. And also, um, I should say, Congratulations for putting up such a very, very nice symposium that is already a great success. So congratulations. And uh, Rogério, I was asked to show a case. I'm sure it's going to be a, a, a nice case with some teaching points and, and some good points to discuss. And uh, if I can have some help here to share my screen. Stop here. 
Yes, I did it. So before uh, Fabio comes with the question, can uh, we have some? Uh, Andrea Monica is our moderate digital moderator. Do you have any questions from the audience, uh, Andrea? Can you see it right now? So can we, we come from, with a question yeah, from, the, sure. from the audience before Fabio? Sure, sure, Doctor uh, Doctor Scott. Thank you for a great presentation and great lecture. Uh, we have some questions here from the audience, and people are addressing about uh, asking about the new devices for the treatment of the mitral regurgitation. Uh, one of the questions is very interesting. Uh, they are asking about if you believe that uh, instead of repairing the mitral valve using uh, uh, the new devices for replacement of the valve, we're going to be able to treat or uh, more patients, patients that would probably not be uh, selected as co-op trial did? Uh, yes, I thank you for the question. It, I, as I understand it, you're asking me, does having transcatheter mitral valve replacement extend the number yeah. and types of patients that we can treat? Yeah. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think one of the things is that co-op showed that we can treat secondary MR very well. And the same thing goes for Everest II trial for many of those patients with degenerative disease. But it's the patients that didn't get in there, those patients with MAC, those patients with a 3A mechanism, uh, some degree of stenosis, that I think we can now look forward to with promise of treating them with a transcatheter mitral valve replacement option. Okay, thank you. And is Fabio, we have some more questions. Is Fabio ready? Uh, Yes, I'm ready. Can you see the slides? Could yes. You, could you put the slides on, on the screen, please? Yes, Fabio. Okay. Now we can see. Okay, so here's the case. It's a 75-year-old female. Uh, this patient... Uh, had a medical history in 1998. She was submitted to a mitral valve repair with a Barlow disease. In 2016, she was reoperated uh, to do a mitral valve replacement. In this time, she has persistent AFib, anemia, uh, several blood transfusions, and GI bleeding. Her medications, she was on apixaban due to a fib, amiodarone, uh, furosemide, and levothyroxine. Her clinical presentation, she, she presented with an acute uh, presentation of shortness of breath starting the week before. Uh, she was in, in class, uh, symptoms of heart failure class four. And at presentation, she was uh, the, with, with fever, axillary temperature of 37.4, and uh, with a holosystolic murmur grade uh, 4 plus over the apical region and irregular pulse due to AFib. The lungs decreased murmurs and diffuse rails. The x-ray, you can see here, a lot of congestion and, and uh, her labs, uh, hemoglobin of 8, creatinine of 1.14, BNP of over 800, and C-reactive protein of 7. The EKG showed a feed with uh, increased heart rate, 100 to 120. So she uh, was submitted to an echo. Uh, the left atrium was 47. The left ventricle preserved left ventricular ejection fraction of 61%. Pulmonary hypertension, 72 millimeters of mercury with severe TR, tricuspid regurgitation. 
uh, mild uh, gradient at, at the aortic valve of 12 with mild regurg as well. The echo evaluation of the mitral bioprosthetic valve showed a thickened mitral uh, uh, bioprosthetic, bioprosthetic leaflets with a collapsed third anterolateral leaflet with a significant jet, uh, eccentric jet towards the posterior wall. You can see the images here, let me show you. This is the, still the transthoracic. An eccentric jet. And here you, you can see the mitral valve with this uh, tethering of the, the leaflet here. Do you have the the, well, the valve? Which which valve was uh, used? No, we we didn't have this information, uh, but we could we could get this. Uh, I will show you in a minute. So, do you want to stop here, uh, Rogério and and yeah. Saad? Yeah, I think that's a good moment for for us to stop. And we have in in yeah. the panel we have two clinicians. <laughs> One is expert in the imaging, one surgeon, and one interventional cardiologist. So maybe we can start with the clinicians we have here, our chief of the cardiology, Dr. Carizzi Polanzic, and one of our staff members, Dr. Roberto Meyer. So maybe uh, first Carizzi and then after Roberto, what do you think about this, this case? This is a difficult situation that sometimes presents to us in an emergency department. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, just to summarize, as, as far as I understood, the 70 plus years old lady with acute pulmonary edema, I'm not so sure, are you hearing me? Okay. Yes. Uh, with acute pulmonary edema, with AFib, and probably uh, valve dysfunction, acute valve dysfunction with a lot of congestion. And as far as I understood in this case, we are not so sure what's the cause of this, if it's a thrombus, if it's a dysfunction because of the, the prosthesis is, is old and uh, actually uh, the, the anterior lift just fell out, or if the patient could have an endocarditis because of the fever in the, the presentation. So this is, could be my hypothesis uh, actually probably we'll have to stabilize the patient first and then consider a procedure uh, and see what's what's going on with this uh, with this mitral valve. I'd like to, to stop here and hear from my colleagues. Yes, Cariz, it's a very acute presentation uh, and the valve is only four years old. So your hypothesis were exactly the same we, we thought here. Roberto, my like to comment. For your kind invitation, and I, I think uh, as the same as uh, Dr. Carizzi, um, uh, it's um, acute uh, acute failure of the bioprothesis, and I I would like to understand why, and uh, first of all, we stabilize the patient, and um, and and try to solve the problem. Maybe we can. Um here, uh, Marcelo here, with, uh, with, uh, which is an echocardiography, and then Dr. Scott Lin, uh, what does he think, uh, probably thinking valve in valve, transeptal, uh, what should we need more in terms of imaging uh, to plan this procedure, especially uh, uh, knowing that the, the main concern is the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction? Okay, looking at the echo images, definitely uh, this patient have um, a structural uh, problem in the left flat of the mitral valve pro uh, prosthesis. Uh, a TOE would give us more quality of imaging to evaluate if uh, infective endocarditis uh, is present or not, but uh, I, I cannot see other solution for this patient uh, despite the uh, mitral valve replacement. Dr. Scott Lim, uh, uh, Dr. Scott Lim, could you comment on this uh, uh, at this moment? Uh, what what uh, else do you think it's necessary? Uh, TE, uh, uh, a CT scan to uh, 
better evaluate the LVOT? And what do you think about the, about the tricuspid valve to fix it together with the mitral or just uh, the mitral? So I agree with you. The left ventricular alpha tract after you do a valve replacement in the mitral position is really important to better understand. And we found that doing a multi-phase CT scan is probably the best tool to figure that out. Uh, and oftentimes what you have to do is not just get the scan, then you have to put a phantom, a projection of what the valve that you're going to implant in that mitral position is going to look like and to see how far that encroaches on the left ventricular alpha tract. And then we find looking at it in the early systolic phases, because it's the majority of the blood flow goes out the left ventricular alpha tract in the first 10 or 20 percent of the RR interval. And so looking in those phases and making a measurement and making sure that the left ventricular alpha tract is at least 160 to 180 square millimeters in size should allow you enough of a left ventricular alpha tract to do that procedure without a significant uh, gradient there. Um, I think it's also really important, as the other speakers brought up too, to knowing what size and type of valve this is so you know what size valve you can put inside it from a transcatheter approach, because if it's too small a valve in the mitral position, you're going to run into patient prosthesis mismatch concerns, and the patient may be better served by then having a full open surgical replacement instead. Perfect, Scott. Uh, I always like to hear your points. I think that uh, we are trying, unfortunately, do not have the, the the, the amount of technology that you have in U.S., but here in Brazil, we are walking <laughs> through this. So for such as one of our interventionists in our cat lab, so how do you handle this patient in the intervention perspective before move to surgery? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, I think that the, the interventional cardiologist uh, uh, has nothing to do right now. Uh, 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 I agree with our uh, colleagues that uh, we have to understand better what is going on and uh, plan what we are going to do. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to see uh, other uh, uh, exam, um, echo, uh, trans transesophageal echo or, or so to understand uh, what's going on with this lady and to see the risk uh, for uh, open heart surgery maybe. So we have uh, to go to go forward. Okay. Uh, okay. Ju ju just before going on, uh, Fabio, let's uh, mm -hmm. hear Orlando, which is a cardiovascular surgeon here in Brazil and is involved with uh, open surgery and uh, yeah. transcatheter valves as well. Do you think, Orlando, that uh, open conventional surgery is an option for this lady to uh, for with two previous uh, mitral valve interventions and with a severe tricuspid regurgitation, or you would, would go uh, straight away to, to think in a transcatheter uh, uh, solution? Yes, I think it's, as you you know, is very high risk for conventional surgery. This is two surgeries before, and I think it's acute patient, and I would like to think in a transcatheter solution for this patient. It's a high risk by patient for an insert treat surgery. Perfect. Fabio, let's go ahead, Fabio. Okay. You have to but treat this Fabio, patient. Our, our thinking here was that we are we were a little bit concerned about the, the possibility of endocarditis in this patient. And we thought it would be very, very important to, to know which was the etiology of this uh, acute uh, uh, mitral uh, degeneration of this, this, this valve. And uh, because, of course, if the patient has endocarditis, we wouldn't consider a transcatheter solution for this, the case. This, the, the patient would be a surgical candidate, right? So we, we thought it was very, very important to know a little, to study this a little bit better to understand the etiology of this problem. So we went ahead and did a PET CT um, because uh, you know that helps a lot to to the diagnosis of endocarditis, especially in prosthetic endocarditis. So, uh, but the PET CT only showed uh, 
pulmonary signs of glycolytic hypermetabolism, so it's compatible with uh, pneumonia. And uh, the, the bioprosthetic valve had an indeterminate aspect not suggestive of endocarditis. So we, we decided to treat her with antibi antibiotics and, and go ahead. This is the echo, the TE. I think you can you can appreciate the images a little bit more now uh, because of uh, the image quality of the TE is much better. We couldn't find any signs of endocarditis like vegetations or uh, aeromitral uh, uh, thickening. And uh, we saw that there was a tear in, in the uh, prosthetic leaflet. So I, I can show you here the images. Very clear image of rupture of this leaflet. You can see here the eccentric jet, very significant MR. So you can see here the, the jet. And from the atrial and from the ventricular view, you can see one ruptured leaflet here. We did the calculation of the risk scores. This uh, IRIS score two, the risk of mortality was 12. And the STS score was around Eight eight percent mortality risk. So uh, we're going to stop here to discuss possibility of here, surgery or or yeah. transcatheter yeah. treatment. Think, yes, Fabio, great presentation, great case, and uh, I think that we can stop here for a while and discuss the next steps. I'd like to hear uh, from Scott because the, the, in, for this patient in Brazil, maybe we're going to have a solution only for the mitral valve. But what do you do in US if you have, even in a randomized trial or, or, or first in man trial, you, if you have an option to treat also the, the, tr the tricuspid valve, known as the forgotten valve sometimes, would you treat both or first you're gonna go for the, for the mitral valve, Scott? Yeah, I would go for the first for the mitral valve. And I think that's one of the really nice things about transcatheter options is you don't have to do them all at once. You can do the procedure serially. You can treat first the mitral or you can treat the aortic valve and then see how the patient does and let them heal up and see if it is warranted to go on treat the tricuspid at a later date. Because we know that approximately at least a third of patients that with MR and TR, um, that if, particularly if they have high PA pressures and a high wedge pressure, that if you treat the MR, the tricuspid valve gets better. Uh, and also many of the tricuspid specific devices are on clinical trial and the clinical trials do not allow you to do concomitant procedures. So we often would treat the mitral valve, put a new transcatheter valve and valve mitral, let her heal up. She gets through a 30 day exclusion period per the clinical trial protocol. And if she still has significant tricuspid regurgitation at that point, then enroll her in a trial with one of these new tricuspid devices. Okay, Fabio. Okay, so uh, so for transcatheter, we decided to go ahead because endocarditis was not likely. A negative blood cultures and PET CT. We we consider this patient uh, very high risk or inoperable, and we decided to go ahead with a transeptal uh, mitral valve involved uh, replacement. So for planning, uh, we could figure out that the valve of the patient, uh, the surgical valve of the patient was uh, uh, an epic biocore from St. Jude. Uh, she had a, a 31 valve. This is our CT measurements of the, angio CT measurements of the valve, this stent diameter, inside stent diameter of 28.5 and um, the orifice here where we have, where we see contrast is 21. And if you go to the app, you can see that the true internal diameter of this, this valve is 27. 
So based on all, all this information, we decided to go ahead with a sapient tree 29 millimeters. So, uh, of course, we also had to do those, all the analysis that Scott just comment on. This is a, a, a publication that we, we, we participated with our cases with the group of Hajmakar and Cedars and showing that uh, the most important predictor of LVOT obstruction is the NEL LVOT, the predicted NEL LVOT. If it's below 170 square millimeters, uh, we, we, we should turn down the case because it's very, very high risk of LVOT obstruction. And it's uh, a catastrophic situation. Unfortunately, I had uh, one case. And the, one the second... Only, uh, only one question regarding this, Fabio. Are you using yeah. only the CT or are you still using the 3D printing system to, to, to try to rebuild the heart to see how the, 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 the new valve is going to be in the LVOT area? So it's a, a good question. And in the very beginning, a few years ago, I used it to, to do 3D printing in all of these cases. But it's, it's very good to learn in the beginning of your experience. But once you, you feel comfortable with the information that the CT gives you, I think you, you, you don't need the CT printing. Uh, exceptional cases, maybe if you have uh, one doubt, maybe it can help, but not, uh, not for every case. And Rogério, this, the second uh, most important uh, predictor of LVOT obstruction in this paper was the distance between the valve, the mitral valve, and the septum. If it's below 18, it's a high risk uh, case for LVOT obstruction. So these are the, the two um, most important points that we, we consider today, and also the L, uh, left ventricular and diastolic diameter, if it's below 48, it's also uh, high risk. So you, you can see here that yeah. these statistics that is um, a very high sensitivity and specificity for, for LVOT obstruction. I would just add some comment that uh, right now we have some dedicated softwares that you could simulate the, the implant of the valve and observe the new OVOT. Uh, actually, uh, the group of uh, Robert Lang from Chicago, they are working with the enhanced reality and simulating all these procedures, uh, not just with CT, but also with 3D echo. Yeah, this is actually what we did. We used a software uh, called Tremensio to do this analysis. There are other softwares available. There's CVI, for example. There's other softwares that you can use uh, to do this analysis. And this is the now the predicted. You, you project a valve here, uh, the 29 sapient tree that we wanted to use, and you uh, can predict the area of the now LVOT here, that is three, around 308 square millimeters. So it's away uh, above uh, 200, that is what we consider the limit now to do our cases. So the now LVOT area was 378, good. The, the distance between the mitral valve to the septum was 24, that is uh, uh, higher than 18. Uh, the LV and diastolic uh, diameter was 52, also higher than 48, there is the limit. So it was, uh, by CT, it was considered a very, very good case for a, a transeptal mitral uh, valve involved. Fabio, uh, let's say that uh, the, the new LVOT was a borderline like 200. I'd like to hear from you and uh, Scott Lim if you'd consider to use maybe a smaller valve, like a 26, or put it more atrial than ventricular, what what's, uh, what do you think in this borderline cases, just uh, for us to learn with uh, uh, your experience? Please, Scott, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so I, I actually think 200 square millimeters probably isn't that borderline. Per, um, and what I would also say is when in the cardiac cycle, you're measuring that 
because we find about 90% of the cardiac output occurs in the first 20%, so the 10 and the 20% phase. And just make sure we're measuring in those phases. But if for whatever reason, say you are really borderline, like about 150, 160 square millimeters in those phases, then absolutely trying to land the valve as atrially as you can, but still have good sealing is important to do. Um, there is other potential things you can do. Yes, you can choose to use a smaller valve. The ID of this valve was 27 millimeters. Um, I'd be a little hard pressed to over inflate the 26 APM to try and get it to land. I may want to be more creative and use a different valve like the Lotus valve from a transapical point and using their 27 because you can it seals in a much greater length and you can position it and readjust versus the sapient. You just have to fire it in there and wherever it goes, it is. Um, but uh, those are the different options you can use. Okay, yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, but do you consider no, 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 now, now you don't have to crimp more the valve here in Brazil, Fabio. Now it's on label. Yes, that's, in the very beginning, I had to do all the job. Crimping <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> because it was off label and Edward wouldn't send a, uh, a rep to, to help me doing these cases. Right? Your so, life is easy now. Yeah, so yeah, please go, go ahead, go ahead. But very interesting so case. In that paper I showed you, we found out that 50% uh, of the cardiac cycle w was the place where we found um, the smallest um, neo LVOT. So we are we are measuring at 40 to 50 percent of the cardiac cycle uh, using the CT, and also uh, maybe uh, I, I had a few borderline cases as you mentioned, uh, Sadi, and I had cases that uh, at the end of the procedure had a, a, a mild LVOT gradient and moderate LVOT gradient, but without uh, severe hemodyna hemodynamic compromise and and we could handle this. Uh, but still, if you have a case around 200, I would tell you to think twice because the chances of having a LVOT obstruction is, is still, uh, still a little bit high. So uh, this is the case. I always like to place two wires in the ventricle, two safari wires in the ventricle. So uh, I use an eight millimeter balloon. Most of uh, operators use larger balloons like 10, 12, 14 balloons. But leaving the second wire in place, if you have some problem, problem trying to cross the septum with the sapient valve, you still have the other wire and you can put a balloon there and a larger balloon there and, and cross the septum. So this, this is the, re the reason why I use two wires. This is the valve, it has already crossed the septum. It's positioned, um, as you can see, it's not very coaxial, as usual for a transeptal uh, procedure. You can see here, the beginning of the when you cannot point. when you cannot see the ring of the the, the, the previous prosthesis, how do you do you, which reference you use to, to release the valve? Yeah, that's a very good question. We use uh, 3D echo. Uh, it gives you a, a, a very good imaging, and you can um, check the coronary sinus on your, on your, or the left circumflex in your CT, see how close it is to the mitral valve, and you can place a wire there and, and you, you, ha you have a reference. We have uh, six cases without any, any uh, marker of the mitral valve done, and they were all, all successful. So this is the deployment of the valve. Uh, the target here was to deploy 10 to 20% atrial and 80 to 90% ventricular. And we achieved this here. We are using uh, every day uh, more, uh, for these cases, it's been much more common that we are using non-compliant balloons at the end 
of uh, the procedure to gain more space and reduce the, the trans uh, mitral gradient. So this is the largest non-compliant balloon that we have in Brazil, a 26 millimeter balloon, an Atlas Gold. So we did a, a, a violation here. We still gained uh, some space inside the 29 safety valve. And the, the final result was a uh, mean graded of three. Uh, we had no, no additional gradient, LVOT gradient. The pulmonary pressure went down from 70 to 40. And this is the, the final uh, result. You can see beautiful uh, sapien valve here with the leaflets freely moving here. The 3D image is very nice as well. You can see the leaflets here uh, the, with the transcatheter valve inside the surgical valve. And this is, is the very small ASD that you can see here at the end of the procedure that we decided to leave it there because there is a left to right shunt and it's small, so we decided to leave it there. Only one case we had to close uh, the septum because of uh, severe TR, tricuspid regurg, that um, the shunt was right to left and the patient uh, presented with hypoxia. <clears throat> Uh, great, Fabio. And uh, the, as, as the patient had uh, AFib, you, you kept on uh, warfarin? No, she was on a NOAC. She continued on, on NOAC. She was discharged seven days after the procedure. And this is two months after the procedure now. And she's uh, uh, returned to functional class one. Uh, I think we can hear from uh, Scott Lim about the anticoagulation regimen in patients with uh, valve in valve. Yeah, valve in valve mitral, I think we have to be a bit cautious on because clearly you're planning the prosthetic, the tab valve inside of the degenerated aortic prosthesis. So there's going to be areas of stasis and uh, certainly there has been risk for thrombosis. So uh, having these patients, I don't think we can have on just uh, antiplatelet agents only. We really need to have them on a full anticoagulation. And I realize that causes complexity in parts of the world where not every patient can get access to either a more expensive NOAC or uh, monitoring of warfarin. Um, but hopefully in the future we can Technology will make it better so that we can have synthetic leaflets or other things that don't require anticoagulation. But right now, I'd be cautious about it. Perfect, Scott. Before we have uh, four minutes before closing the session, I'd like to ask from the panel if there's any question for you or for Fabio from the panel or for, or, or for the audience. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I just would like to make a comment. I guess that now we are seeing this complex case and we've been following this case uh, sometimes. And actually, uh, today, we don't have uh, options for them. You usually treat from a clinical perspective and ho hope for the surgeons to accept the case and re-operate the patient. And it's really great to see that the cardiology nowadays, uh, we are able to offer something else, that we could think about something else for these patients. Because uh, so far, we, we just kind of uh, or prohibit the procedure or just hope for the patient to get better. So it's really nice and it's, was wonderful to hear from Scott Lim that we have other options coming on uh, in the future and probably in the near future. So my last question will be to him that compared to Tavi, uh, how do you see the future for mitro and tricuspid uh, procedures? Are we that far from using and having reference centers all over the world? Or do you think this will be easier and we will see this in our practice in the near future? I mean, two or three years from now, talking about Brazil. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, so a few years ago, probably eight or nine or 10 years ago, I came down to Brazil and uh, got to meet, see many of my friends and also try and introduce the concept of mitroclip. 
And I fully understand some of the both regulatory and the financial economic challenges of these technologies. I mean, uh, when we do a micro clip here in the United States, I'll see some of the bills and they're like 200,000 US dollars, uh, which is just prohibitive. Uh, and we certainly need better technology, but also we really need technology that is not so uh, expensive. Uh, right now, MitraClip is the only player that has commercial approval for the most part in much of the world. And so they can afford to charge sky high prices. But as we get Pascal in there, as we get Dragonfly or other devices, uh, we really need the prices to come down for these devices. They're just too expensive. Um, when comparing it to Tabby, I think Tabby and aortic valve disease is a binary thing. People are not symptomatic until they are, and then they're at risk of dying. Um, and you get the Tabber valve in position or you don't. It's, it's a lot more simple. Mitral valve disease is a more complicated spectrum, in my opinion. And that's why it's taking longer to develop our understanding our ability to image and our ability to have devices that will allow us to treat these patients from less invasive approaches. Having said that, I've been incredibly impressed by how much we can take a very sick patient with mitral valve disease and do a therapy that doesn't impose a hemodynamic burden on them, meaning we can do a mitral clip, we can do a, even a transcatheter valve replacement in many of them and they can be, their blood pressures are fine. We're not having to rapid pace them. They're not getting sick as we do that, and we're not needing a long recovery period. So I think that holds a lot of promise. And the other part of it is what Greg had commented on earlier is, I think we have to look at our overall cost to our society. Yes, the devices are expensive, but one of the ways to justify them in Brazil, I think, is looking at, well, if we don't repair that patient's mitral regurgitation that is in a setting of a reduced EF, those patients are going to be consuming other healthcare care uh, expenses later on down the line in terms of repeat heart failure hospitalizations. And I think we need to look at the whole package for a patient in our society and find out hey, is this going to save us money in the long run? And if so, make those arguments to the regulatory agencies of our countries and, and to really show where the true value is. And at the same time, going back to industry and saying they still have to make them cheaper for us. Perfect, Scott. Uh, I think that we are almost over time. And there have any, no questions from the audience. So I'd like to thank you very much, Scott, your superb presentation. Uh, Fabio also, our good friend from Sao Paulo that is frequently here in, down in, in Porto Alegre. Thanks a lot for a brilliant presentation and also for our panel, distinguished colleagues from Porto Alegre that uh, give a lot of good inputs in these nice presentations. So I'd like to, to call my good friend, Dr. Marco Weinstein, the uh, chief of the CAT lab at Moniz Vento. He's going to do a few words as the take home message of this first day. Thank you. Okay, um, that was really nice, very, very uh, um, broad lectures that both Scott and, and uh, I think the case that Fabio just presented had to, uh, give us a, gave us a chance to, for Scott uh, to, to go further in the options for both replacement, repair, we, we discussed about tricuspid, Rogério made, made a very good point on when to treat tri tricuspid disease and this patient that Fabio just address if the tricuspid valve uh, didn't get better. It, it did, but it, if uh, in case it didn't get better, it would be a case for maybe to use some tricuspid uh, uh, repair with one of the devices that uh, Scott showed us. So we have to finish. I'm going to show one of, uh, a few slides uh, just to summarize as a closing remark, because tomorrow we have more to go. We, and so please, can you pres uh, show us um, my first slide? and you're gonna move very quickly. Go, um, so we just addressed today the evolving role of transcatheter valve interventions in function MR. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to, to see the guidelines and this is, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, new things in the Brazilian guidelines, but also the very well established guidelines from the uh, European society have addressed and raised a few major questions about severity of the valvular disease, and the importance of what is the optional treatment modality, including the valve replacement, uh, surgical valve replacement or repair, and catheter, catheter inter intervention. Uh, 
we recognize that uh, the function MR definitely carries an ominous prognosis, in, especially in patients with reduced heart failure, both in patients with ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The mechanism involved uh, for mitral regurgitation uh, can be either uh, severe left ventricular dilation, as Greg uh, demonstrated to us before, or also a leaflet distortion uh, causing a tenting of the uh, papillary muscle and tent uh, also tethering of the, the valve. And uh, Scott has addressed very well with much more details uh, the different approaches, including the leaflet approach with the mitral clip, and now the Pascal, and also the direct and bow and indirect aneuroplasty with different devices. Uh, also, he has uh, um, brought to us the options of valve repair that are being tested in different trials. The Tendine valve is probably the most well studied and close to be uh, used in the in the real uh, in, in the market in the real in nowadays. Although there is a lot of uh, things, a lot of time to go uh, to solve the LVOT obstruction and other issues uh, regarding the uh, replacement, the percutaneous uh, replacement. The two trials, the CRAPT and, and, and the in uh, the other trial, uh, also has uh, the <clears throat> has had been very well discussed. I don't need to, to go into details. They are different. Uh, and the main difference uh, are the that we found discre discrepant findings that it could not be explained only by a methodological issue. There must be a clinical issue behind it because the mitral far patients which had much less severe uh, mitral regurgitation and, and, and the LV dimensions were much bigger than in the CRAP trials and this probably explained the main difference between the two trials in terms of results. Uh, a lot of things were discussed today in terms of um, cost effectiveness, and I'm getting to the end. This is a, probably the, one of the last slides. Uh, Transcatheter mitral valve repair, as Scott was saying, uh, it, can, it definitely can be cost effective, definitely, because if you look to crap patient, to crap like patients, and as, a lo as long as we can achieve similar results at level of cost, it, it is cost effective, because mitral valve patients, they live longer than aortic patients. They are usually younger and they come many, very often to the hospital. They go back and forth to the hospital. So if you have something to, to offer to the, uh, them, and this uh, device can, can reduce the, the number of times and the number of hospitalizations, definitely the device, if it's is, is well indicated, it, 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 it can result in uh, uh, a cost-effective uh, therapy for the patients. Uh, so the very li last slide is that I think that transcatheter mit uh, mitral valve replacement, it is a reality and is rapidly and constantly evolving field. Uh, functional uh, mitral regurgitation probably represents the principal target for uh, transcatheter mi mitral valve replacement and repair or repair since pr prompt the identification of these patients with uh, left ventricular dysfunction who are symptomatic despite guideline medical therapy and with severe disprop disproportionate MR, we discuss a lot of the concept of dispro disproportionate MR tonight, tonight, is associated with an improved survival and reduced heart failure hospitalizations, which at the end is our main objective. Thanks a lot. I, I want to, to, uh, to congratulate my colleagues, the whole panel, the, everybody that is still in the audience, and they invite you uh, for tomorrow at the very same time, 7 o'clock, right? Uh, we're going to discuss a lot about aortic disease. Uh, we have very important um, uh, guest lectures tomorrow, including Dr. Mark Leon, Eberhard Gruby, who uh, gave us, um, who did the first uh, TAVI in, uh, in south of Brazil, and also um, uh, Lang from, from, from Munich, uh, who is a very well-known surgeon in Europe. And they, they will give us a lot of support to the lecture tomorrow and a nice panel to discuss, right? I think we, we if you want to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm concluding the session, so if you guys, guys want to say something else, please go ahead. Just see you tomorrow. <laughs>
um evento gratuito e 100% online com os maiores nomes nacionais e internacionais da área. 10 e 11 de novembro de 2020. Realização, Faculdade de Ciências da Saúde e Moinhos de Vento, Núcleo de Valvulopatia e Cardiopatia Estrutural, Serviço de Cardiologia, Cirurgia Cardíaca e Vascular do Hospital Moinhos de Vento.